afternoon. So welcome to the third edition of Arya's Kokum Who Is Me. My name is Crystal and I am today, on today's episode, we are going to look at task management materials and how to prepare a blank for baiting. So here you go. This is what today's episode is about. So I'd like to start by sharing this photo of my daughter. I did this regalia in 2005, 2006, and what I did is I just spent a couple winters, like I did her beadwork, I did her shawl, I did all the sewing over the winter. And now that it's winter, and especially with COVID, we're stuck at home, so let's, um, I just want to show you, you know, start to finish how I'm going to do uh, regalia. So to start with um, today, task management. Now, it's important to realize that if you really want a really nice beaded, you know, uh, regalia to wear on the Powell Trail and to be ready for the Powell Trail, don't expect to do it in a few weeks. Expect it to take a few months because if you're a grandmother, Kokum, and mother like me, you know, life gets in the way. Some of us have part-time jobs, we have things to do. It's going to take a while. So whatever you do, don't rush. Plan things out ahead of time and allow for a lot of time because you never know what happens, right? Life happens. <clears throat> so yeah, be patient. If you want regalia in two weeks, it's not going to happen with this video series. I just want to be very clear about that. Uh, when I, whenever I've made regalia in the past, I've always allowed at least three months, four months, six months. Actually, the more time you invest in it, the better it will be. Um, so let's get right into materials. Now, I spoke about this briefly in previous, uh, in the previous episodes one and two, and I just want to get back to that subject right now. Okay? All right, so let's get started on materials. So there's two main things to realize about materials. Now, there's two kinds. There's natural and then there's synthetic. Um, <clears throat> Natural is best. Natural is cotton broadcloth and a mixture of 100% cotton. The nice thing about a natural material is it breathes and it tends to be, you know, um, a little bit more hardier. It's easier to iron. It's easier to work with. It's easier to sew. Now, when you get into the polyester or the synthetic materials, those include uh, uh, polyester uh, blends, um, rayon which is a stretchy material lycra that kind of thing they do ha tend to have a wider variety but they take a lot of care to work with especially if you're ironing or um, working combining it with another material such as cotton broadcloth i like to use cotton broadcloth uh, as much as possible because i find they're very vibrant colors now let's just take a moment um, when you're preserving the intensity of the color of the material you're working with and you want to do all this, you know, be prepared ahead of time. A good thing to do is soak it in vinegar. And the reason you want to soak your material in vinegar prior to, you know, sewing and all that kind of thing and washing it is because it, it holds the dye in there longer. And you really want your regalia to last a long time. So let's say you've got a really vibrant pink and you, you know, you want to preserve it, soak it in vinegar for about a day, take it out, put it in the, in the wash machine, pre-wash it because cotton shrinks. Natural materials tend to shrink. The synthetic materials don't tend to shrink, so that's why you want to wash it. You want to pre-treat it because the last thing you want to do is head into sewing. You've sewn it all together, you know, right from your brand new material, and then you throw it in the wash and everything's all out of, out of whack because Certain materials will shrink faster than others. So be aware of that. Now that gets on to the second, um, the second subject with materials and that is when it comes to heat and bond or interfacing. There are two kinds of interfacing. Interfacing is the substance that makes, that you would use in colors or a belt or a form fitted por portion of your regalia. Interfacing comes in two, two varieties. Number one is the sew-on interfacing, and the second part is iron-on interfacing. I always prefer sew-on interfacing because there's no glue. When you use an iron-on interfacing, you're going to use your iron to apply heat 
to adhere the interfacing to your material to the back side of your material now there's glue involved in that and when you sew with that that tends to jam up your sewing machine needle so just remember that when you're working with interfacing or you're working with heat and bond to apply an applique remember that there is glue in there therefore whenever i do like interfacing or applique i'm always using sew on varieties because there's no glue involved and this will become very important when you're sewing along you're going at a good speed and suddenly your thread creep keeps breaking the reason is because you have slight residue on your needle and that's what's going to break your thread so it's very important that you're aware of the substances in these tools that you're using like a lot of people do like heat and bond what I would suggest is to cut your heat and bond inside your design so that your sewing machine uh, does not pass through it. So that's a very important point. <clears throat> now the third point I want to get to with materials is ironing. Using an iron and an ironing board or an ironing surface is very important. Like you don't need an ironing board. An iron is very important. And it's very important that you look at the little dials on your iron because heat settings make a world of difference in pressing your material. So the iron is important because once you sew a seam, you're gonna, you know, uh, iron it flat. And ribbons, you're gonna iron them flat. Your applique, you're gonna iron it flat. And the settings on an iron are very important. Natural materials like cotton are easier to press. Synthetic materials, you have to be very, very careful. And I always recommend that you iron a test area so that you know how your iron will, will react. And I'm saying this from a thousand mistakes that I've made. One time I made a really beautiful, you know, applique. I went to put it on a shawl. I went to iron it. My iron was too hot and the synthetic material wrinkled and shriveled up. And I was just like horrified because all of my hours of work just went out the window. So it's very important that you do a test area first. Pressing cloths are very important. What, um, what I use is really just those bandanas that you can get from the dollar store. I have a white one. Um, but if you're stuck for a pressing cloth and you don't have one, like a pressing cloth is okay, you have your material down on the ironing board, you use a pressing cloth over top that you're gonna lay flat, and then you're gonna iron right onto the pressing cloth. And that avoids any residue that might be on your iron from getting onto your material. Now, if you're stuck for a pressing cloth and you don't have anything fancy around, what also works is simple, simply a brown paper bag or a manila envelope. Paper works really, really good if you're going to press. Um, also, if you're going to iron certain materials, um, be careful of whether, whether or not you use steam. Me, I just iron dry, and you don't need to apply pressure to your iron. That's important to notice, be, to note because it's not the pressure that makes the seam. It's actually the heat from the iron. So. Use a little test area on, on the materials that you've chosen. Uh, make sure you have a pressing cloth. And yeah, be careful, be cognizant of whether or not there's steam involved. Mm -hmm. Final note on irons, it's important to use distilled water. Distilled water has actually gone through a, uh, a process of steam and the steam is collected and that's distilled water. Now the reason it's important to use distilled water is because if you just use tap water, into your iron you're going to get a buildup of things like lime and calcium and sometimes that's going to come out through those little holes on the iron and you're going to be ironing along and suddenly you're going to get a brown spot and you're going to go <gasps> not good so distilled water in your iron and in your spray bottle if you use steam especially for cotton like steam is good for 100 percent cotton then yes please be aware of the materials you put into your iron. So distilled water in your iron is gonna make it last longer. It's gonna be for a better ironing and make sure it says distilled water on it because you don't want any residue, any of foreign substances in your iron or on the project in which you're ironing. All right, so with that said, our next portion of the video is actually preparing beading blanks. So I'm going to change camera angles and we're going to go through that step by step. <clears throat>
All right, so let's get started. To today's show, we are doing how to transfer your pattern onto blanks so that you can do the beat. All right, so we've already done this. We've already designed and colored in, you know, exactly what we want. So this is the image, and it always helps to outline it in marker. Color it so you know exactly what it's going to look like. So I've prepared some stuff ahead of time. And what you do is you take this page and then you, you trace it. You trace it onto a separate piece of paper as close as you can. Remember, this is for a uh, four-year-old girl, so it doesn't have to be bigger. If this was for an adult lady, it would probably be a good, you know, two inches longer. Like when I design my hair ties, they're going to be much bigger than this. But she's just a little fart, so she, they don't need to be very big. And what you're going to do once you trace it and you cut this out, then you're going to put it against a window and do a mirror image. So I've done that already, held it up, and I have my two mirror image because these are going to be the hair ties. I think it'd be nice if the dragonflies faced in. So there's the design. And uh, let's go to town. Now, once you have the two mirror image, you're going to need a few things. You are going to need your mirror image items. You're going to need some thread. Uh, you're going to need a little pair of scissors. You're going to need your needle. You're going to need two pieces of uh, the, I think this is called, uh, what is it called, thick stuff or something, or stiff stuff. And then two pieces of heavy grade cotton. This is the same variety of cotton that you would use to, you know, stretch material on. So you need two pieces of those, two pieces of this. So, this is what, I, what you do. This is how you um, assemble it. This is your pattern. And as long as you have it like this, you're gonna put that. You're gonna bead right through the paper. I do, because this isn't good. This is you want this to uh, last. So once you have it like this, what you're gonna do is you're gonna baste. And remember, baste means to just sew very quickly, big stitches, just to put it together. So you're gonna do that with this, and we're gonna baste that. And then what we're going to do is uh, we'll cut the corners. Okay, so just give me two seconds here. So actually, now that we're, we're going along here, it actually occurred to me that I should show you guys exactly what I mean about beeswax. So you see these little uh, no notches that are through my beeswax? I just run my thread through there at least twice. And what this does is it stops your uh, thread from tangling up. And you won't get any knots as you're sewing along. And I always double thread my work just because I want stuff to last. And yeah. So, like again, a cake of beeswax here. You can get it at any craft store. Regular wax will work too, but uh, I prefer beeswax. So a cake like that will last you for a good, you know, year, two years. You know, as long as you keep it away from pets and take good care of it. It should last you that long. Now, threading the needle. There we go. Hey, sorry. There we go. Putting the needle in my mouth. Probably not the most intelligent place to put it, but that's where I put it. Oh no! There we go. Always line it up. Double knot it. So that this is exactly how I start beating. Um, double thread. Because you can always trim the ends off after. And then you pull this tight so it's even. And yes, I always make sound effects. My daughter told me I make a lot of sound effects. And then I have to realize that, yeah, she's right. So that's how I load my thread. And then you're just going to like very, very loosely uh, sew this together. Hold it up to the light. Make sure you know, all your pieces, there's nothing overlapping and whatnot, and that you get your entire design on there. Okay, so just give me two seconds, and uh, I'll sew this up. All right, so here we're going on the little hair ties, preparing the beading blanks for Arya's hair ties. So, um, I can see the design through that. Now, we started with this, 
We started with the stiff stuff, the design, and then the cardboard. I mean, cardboard. Canvas! Sorry, the canvas. So we sewed that together. And what I mean by basting is just really loose stitches, right? Because you just want to hold it together. It doesn't have to be perfect. Uh, it doesn't have to be anything like that. You see what the back looks like here, right? So once you've sewn on the design, then I actually rounded the corners for when I'm actually beading. And the reason is because if you start beading like this, I'll tell you, your edges while you're sewing, it's going to get caught on that all the time and it's going to drive you nuts. So I really don't want anybody to, you know, get annoyed while they're beading. So I round the edges. That way the, when you're beading along, the, uh, you don't get caught on anything. So, uh, and then once I've rounded it off, I'm going to baste along the edges again. Why? Because I don't want my edges to fray. I don't want any little pieces coming apart. I don't want this thing falling apart. So now that uh, I've done the last stitch, I'll show you what we're going to do. We're just going to end it because this is the wrong side of uh, the hair tie, right? So what we're going to do is, what I usually do is just put a little knot in there. I actually try to separate these two threads like such. Then I cut it about there. Whoops. Then I separate these two. And I never have nails. Uh, I'm just not the type to have long nails. <laughs> not the high maintenance or anything like that. I do a lot of work with my hands. And watch today I'm just not going to get this. Alright, we're going to separate them. Then I usually put four knots. Don't ask me why. It's just the way I do it. Been doing this for quite a few years. So I put four little knots in there on the wrong side because the canvas is the bottom. So you're just going to cut that off like that, like such. And I always keep one of these around. This is a handy little garbage, and you don't want to be, you know, you don't want to leave a pile of garbage on your workspace. So. That always works. And then once you're, so this beading blank is now ready for beading. I can take it, um, I, uh, what I actually have is a little fishing tackle box. And I have my little beads in case I'm going somewhere and have to wait for a while. Or, you know, it's always handy to have beads and you can just throw this little blank. These two little blanks and the colors that you need and uh, while you're waiting or while you're outside. Uh, I've been known to do some bead work in the park and on a picnic bench, that kind of thing. Um, then yeah, you can just throw your little supplies in, away you go. This thing is really handy, I'll say that much for sure. So that's how you prepare beading blanks. Give me two seconds and I'll finish the other one. Okay, my good people, so this is what it looks like, the finished product looks like. We have two beading blanks. Um, you see the designs on there. What you might want to do is you might want to put this against the window and just trace out the design because like here in bright light it just takes two seconds to put it against that window and do the design but here are your two rounded beading blanks ready we finished the edges we basted it on there very loosely and we're ready to go this is ready for beads i do want to say though um, uh, my, our next video is going to be preparing you know because you want to prepare everything for beading like this is a good start, the hair ties, that's always a good place to start. But we're also going to do pieces like the headband. Um, and the next, tomorrow's video, or sorry, not tomorrow, but the next video, episode number four, is going to be cutting, measuring, and preparing the yoke for beading. So we're going to do basically the same thing, not, um, don't, don't worry, it's not too complicated. But there is a go-to product that uh, I want you to get. And that's uh, this this one here. This here is uh, a product called Freycheck. And you can get it at Walmart. I think it's $3.85, something like that, Canadian. Any Walmart uh, in Canada or Fabricland. I believe Michael's may have it too also. But it's really cheap. So it's just a little wee bottle, about yay tall. But this is really important because you don't want your work to fray on the edges. So um, this bottle here. Get some of this, order it online, or pick, do curbside pickup, whatever you have to do. But I always like to have at least one or two bottles of this on hand. 
Um, and I am picking some more stuff up on Thursday, so I will actually have the freight check uh, next time. Okay, so this is my go-to product. I have not done any beadwork in the last uh, 15, 20 years without this product because this ensures that you're, you have a good product that's not going to fray or fall apart. All right, so make sure you have that, uh, you know, you get that soon by the time you finish beading. Because once we get all the beads on and it's finished, I'll show you how to finish it. And then we'll do into, uh, go into edging. But that'll probably be like episode five or six. So thanks for coming to episode three today. Preparing, you know, beading blanks for hair ties. Now you have a good foundation and you can start beading. Uh, episode four is going to be like actually beading. I'll do a little bit of clip of me how I'm actually beading. I'm going to be using Delica beads and seed beads for the detail on this. I'll have one of them done. And uh, yeah, so thank you for coming to today's video. Hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you in episode four.